I couldn't believe this. They said, uh, these 13 evolutionists said, sponges represent our distant animal relatives, end quote. And I'm going, you know, th those four cells that I just mentioned, right. there, you know, they're unique to sponges. Uh, the only thing that sponges and people have in common is DNA. They both are programmed by the DNA molecule, but that's not evidence of a common ancestor, that's evidence of a common designer. Hello everyone, welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. Uh, I'm your host, Trey, and today I have with me Dr. Frank Sherwin, ICR zoologist. Thanks for being here, Dr. Sherwin. I certainly appreciate it. Awesome. And uh, looking very dapper with the bolo. <laughs> I, I, I like it. I'm going to draw attention to it because nobody wears those anymore. So, uh, All right. So today we're going to talk about something that I know that you enjoy, uh, maybe some people who are watching this do not enjoy them, uh, and we'll get to that. And get why in a minute. Uh, so there's a lot of animals on this planet. Um, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot. I mean, we think of, of, of mammals, uh, and there's actually like not that many mammals, comparatively speaking, um, to the rest of the animals on this planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, evolutionists, of course, explain away the uh, array of animals, these incredible animals that are uh, that we see. They're like, well, it just, you know, long time evolution, blah, blah, blah. Um, of course, as creationists, uh, not a big fan of that. I disagree. Uh, scripture states that God created animals, not random processes. And we see that a lot of these animals, actually, uh, I would say every animal, uh, but in particular, some animals possess even like a, a greater quantity of these hallmarks of design uh, mm -hmm. that could never have arisen by chance, natural processes, etc. So today, are you ready for this? Today we're talking about invertebrates. Right. Okay. Uh, we're talking about invertebrates. And uh, what is an invertebrate? Well, an invertebrate is an animal that doesn't have a formal brain and spinal cord. Okay. And uh, they don't have an internal skeleton like we do, okay. know, an endoskeleton. They have, uh, however, an exoskeleton. Okay. So the largest phyla of animals on the planet, according to the late Steve Gould out of Harvard, is the uh, arthropods, a phylum arthropoda. And the phylum arthropoda is characterized by paired jointed appendages and this chitinous exoskeleton. Okay. And they are ubiquitous. And so the insects are, uh, for example, arthropods. And, okay. you know, we have so many of those. And then, of course, crustaceans, such as a crab and lobster and shrimp. Those All are, the good seafood. Oh, delicious. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we're going to discuss seven incredible invertebrae. Invertebrates? Mm -hmm. Invertebrates, yeah. Invertebrates. No. If I say invertebrates, is that technically considered wrong? <laughs> You're correct. Okay. Yeah, that would be wrong. Yeah, so, right. yeah vertebrae or something, you know, the, the sections of, of the spinal co uh, column. Okay, I hope you can forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so seven incredible invertebrates. Number one, everyone's favorite animal. The earthworm. Right. All right. So when I think of earthworms, uh, I actually haven't seen them as much as I used to, but I think of them like after rain, you know, they mm -hmm. crawl up and they swirl around. You use them as as uh, as fishing bait often. Um, sure. But let's talk about the earthworm. Uh, is there anything about the earthworm that just makes it unique? There's lots of unique things about the earthworm. They are called the segmented worms or the annelids. And of course, we used earthworms in your introductory biology classes, both in high school and then in college or university. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are the common terrestrial invertebrate that live pretty much underground, turning over the soil, as it were. And really, earthworms, it's been said, are just one long digestive system. Okay. And um, it this lowly earth, earthworm has five five hearts. It has a, a two-hemisphere brain, a multi-organ digestive system, and it's a very important part of the ecosystem. As I say, it keeps the, the, the soil turned over. One, I, I don't want to say scientist, but a naturalist uh, over a century and a half ago, a naturalist said that um, a garden soil could contain up to 50,000 earthworms. 
in, in your typical garden, and this yields about 18 tons of what we call castings, the material that goes through the earthworm. 18 tons of castings per year. That's a lot. So that is a lot. It keeps the soil aerated and all. And of course, uh, there are creatures, vertebrates, so like mammals, moles, underground, just looking for those tasty earthworms. And so what God has done is to provide special sensory uh, design features of the earthworm that can pick up these subtle movements, subtle vibrations. And when they pick them up, of course, they get into what's called an avoidance reaction because they can sense the mole which is making these vibrations as it's digging around looking for earthworms. And so earthworms have a chance to get get away. Okay. Question. Uh, Maybe a little off the cuff, but... I'm interested. Is it true that if you cut an earthworm in half, it becomes two earthworms? Yeah, it all depends where you cut it. Okay. You, you know, because you need to, um, if, if you cut into some of the more important organs, then, of course, it would get killed. But it is true. There are some portions of an earthworm that you can cut, and there's a, an amazing process called regeneration. And the earthworm can regenerate itself. Wow. And that is uh, just an amazing uh, process, uh, starting at obviously the the cellular level right you know how in the world could something like that have come about by chance and time okay so speaking of chance and time mm-hmm. uh what do evolutionists say about this animal uh where did where did the earthworm co- i mean i imagine in the evolutionary time scale of course invertebrates come before vertebrates that's correct, correct yeah mm-hmm. okay uh but where do they say these earthworms came from well, there's an evolutionist by the name of uh, Akbulut, A-K-B-U-L-U-T, and in discussing the last common ancestor, they call it the LCA, the last common ancestor of worms, he used uh, words like is predicted, uh, thought to be, and may have as he attempted to describe the last common ancestor. So I'm not criticizing him, but they, they simply don't know what this LCA is. And we would maintain as creationists, non-evolutionists, that earthworms have always been earthworms. Right. And uh, so, uh, and and they are just amazing. I didn't mention that they're strong, able to push about 10 times their body weight. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, newly hatched, if you will, um, baby earthworms can push uh, 500 times their own body weight. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, the... the, the incredible features of an earthworm are, are just amazing. Also, it's very hard to pull an earthworm out of the, the soil. When you see one, you start to pull it, and you see a red robin that mm-hmm. has an earthworm and is trying to pull it out of its its uh, burrow there. Well, that's because of the design feature of an earthworm that has hair-like projections coming out called setae. And these setae dig into the soil uh, from the side of the earthworm, and that earthworm stays put. Mm-hmm. And, it's locked it's, in place. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's locked there. So uh, just a, a, amazing creatures. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Earthworms. Everybody's favorite uh, animal. Uh, <laughs> now we're going to go to one of my favorite animals, particularly because they're delicious. Uh, sorry to any uh, any shrimp who are listening. We're going to talk about the shrimp. Um, so I've heard shrimp called the cockroaches of the sea. That doesn't sound uh, too appetizing, uh, but I think that they're uh, pretty cool. They taste good. I love to f- get them fried. Um but they're not just food for humans, right? They, right. they serve a purpose. Uh, they have their own life cycle. Um, what about a shrimp makes it unique? Well, shrimp is just are simply that. They are not only unique, but of course they're harvested, for example, in the uh, Gulf states, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the Gulf states produce about 244 million pounds of shrimp per year. That's a lot. Yeah, and there's uh, just a lot. And there's over 2,000 different species. But you're right uh, in that shrimp are a an important part of the food web and, and the kind of the basal part of the ecological system in the ocean. And so there's all sorts of very unique crustaceans or shrimp. And um, one of my favorite shrimp is the snapping shrimp. And you can watch it on YouTube. So all you have to do is type in snapping uh, shrimp. They have what's called asymmetrical claws. And uh, the larger of the two asymmetrical claws can produce a snapping sound that's louder than a gunshot. 
But it doesn't stop there. It can create shock waves capable of breaking aquarium glass. Wow. And before people understood that these species of shrimp can actually do that, they were said, well, I need an invertebrate in my uh, saltwater aquarium. Right. And they would unknowingly get some of these uh, snapping shrimp and come home at the end of the day to a living room full of salt water. Yeah. And, and all of their prize fish are dead. All their <laughs> prize fish are dead. And if people have actually picked up a snapping shrimp and gotten a very serious injury. Wow. Because uh, some scientists call this snapping shrimp possibly the most dangerous creature on Earth. Wow. Yeah, just because it is so devastating in what it, it can do. But uh, zoologists recently discovered a claw joint called a cocking slip joint. Cocking slip joint in this snapping shrimp. It works by a buildup of extreme tension in the claw's muscles before another muscle another muscle releases it, and bang, you get this devastating uh, shock wave that's produced. Wow. And uh, so again, it's it's on YouTube, but they are just fascinating creatures. Cool. Now the shrimp and the shrimp belong to crustaceans, such as the as I mentioned earlier, the um, the crab and the lobsters. Um, the evolutionists use molecular characters, that is protein and DNA, those are the molecular characters, that differs considerably from those based on gro gross anatomical or morphological characters. So you have the, the DNA and protein, that's a molecular character that give you an evolutionary idea of the crustaceans, which include the shrimp. But then over here, you've got these gross morphological features that gives you, gives you a, a different uh, explanation for the evolution. Mm -hmm. Now, if evolution were true, the two should Align. coincide. Yeah. But they don't. You have to choose one or the other. Okay. Do they? Is there a quote unquote last common ancestor for the shrimp? Oh yeah. They they have. A, they hypothesize. They suggest. It's it's simply theoretical that there is a LCA, a last common ancestor for the uh, the crustaceans. Okay. But it's still unknown. It'll always be unknown. Right. Because it doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, do we find shrimp in the fossil record? Yes, we do. As a matter of fact, there was a shrimp found about, oh, I'd say about 10 years ago in in uh, Oklahoma, of oh. all places. So they have this fossilized shrimp in Oklahoma, and one of the authors took this fossilized shrimp, and he compared it to a frozen shrimp that you can get at the supermarket. The two look identical. Wow. I mean, just identical. And, of course, millions of years are tacked on to this fossil shrimp that they found in Oklahoma. But what we like to say so often at ICR is that shrimp have always been shrimp, fish have always been fish, people have always been people. Well, so there's no difference between... Uh, because if you were to have those long years of evolution, you would assume that there'd be some morphological difference between the two, right? Correct. And that's okay. correct. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Next one. I know that this one's a lot of fun. Um, so we're going to talk about the octopus. Now there are a bunch of different octopi. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Octopus or octopi. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of different octopi. Uh, we know like just from looking at them that they're pretty unique uh, from any of the other sea creatures. Um, but Let's talk about what specifically makes them unique. Uh, we, of course, think of oh, eight arms, the, the little suckers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the ink, uh, et cetera. Uh, let's talk about the octopus. Uh, go. Well, they're highly intelligent invertebrates. I mean, highly intelligent. Now, even under the best conditions where they're kept in a, a laboratory somewhere with the saltwater tanks, uh, they only last about three years, and okay. that's the female. The males, of course, uh, don't last more than two years. You know, they're wimpy, but the females, uh, about three years is all they last, but they are highly intelligent. Okay. And uh, when they started work with octopus, in, you know, years ago, decades ago, they would put the octopus in these saltwater tanks and at the end of the day, turn off the lights, close the door, and they would come back to complete pandemonium. The octopus, instead of bedding down for the night, they would get out of the tank and they can get around outside of right. the tank. Uh, we find octopus being able to go from uh, a tidal pool to tidal pool uh, when the tide is out looking for invertebrates to right. eat. And that's exactly what these octopus do 
uh, when at night when nobody's around. They get out of the tank and they play with the lights. They play with the light fixtures. They uh, go ahead and open and close valves, and they're, they're very dexterous in doing that. And at one time, an octopus escaped, a female, and went across the lab to another saltwater tank where you had uh, crabs and such and, and lobsters and all that and had a smorgasbord. <laughs> <laughs> and a feast. then yeah. a feast and then what it, she did was to go back to her own tank and when the researchers came in the next morning uh, they were you know there was an octopus just sitting there looking at the researchers with eyes very much like human eyes vertebrate eyes and that's a, a challenge to evolution what is something lo- like an octopus doing with an ocular vision so much like mm. ours and so the octopus was sitting there looking at these people coming in, and they were looking at this empty tank <laughs> right. that the day before had. Wasn't a, me. No. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, what are you looking at? And so um, they have also chromatophores, and chromatophores are special cells that have pigment. And under the right stimuli from the nervous system, the stimulus from the nerves will cause uh, uh, special muscles in the uh, chromatophores to, to contract in such a way that it causes a color change within a fraction of a second. Mm. And so not only are the octopus a real challenge to evolutionary theory, but the chromatophores that they have are a real uh, challenge as well. Um, Octopus have not one but three hearts. They pump a bluish colored uh, blood. (laughs) And of course, with those eight limbs or arms. And the octopus usually favors two of those eight arms. And um, so... The evolutionist is in a conundrum. They see this as is a highly intelligent animal, which can even alter its own RNA. But it's an invertebrate, which is supposed to be one of the earlier, you know, types exactly. of creatures. Yeah. Right. Okay. And and so it's it's kind of like the bees. Bees are high, high, highly intelligent creatures, as one evolutionist said to, about seven years ago. But the octopus is right up there in terms of. Uh, you know, intelligence mm-hmm. uh, that that any of the vertebrates are. But rather saying that the octopus was created, of course the evolutionists can't do that. Some of the evolutionists are saying that they're so intelligent that they didn't evolve here, but the octopus eggs travel to Earth on a meteor. Uh, that's right. They're saying octopus are aliens. I mean, okay. I hate to defend, right? Yeah. Uh, if... If you're looking at just like sea creatures and you have no concept of like a creative God, mm-hmm. I mean, octopus, octopi do look kind of alien compared <laughs> to everything around it, but still yeah. kind of a ridiculous claim. Yeah. So this uh, one uh, news reporter from Newsweek magazine, her name is Catherine uh, Hignett, H-I-G-N-E-T-T, uh, said in the May 17th issue uh, in 2018 that the delivery was by a comet comment of these uh, flash frozen, uh, and they have to be frozen, yeah. uh, um, o- octopus eggs. And this is a type of something called panspermia. And so uh, evolutionists years ago, they're not seeing it too much today. That's They say that's how life came to Earth. Mm. You had an unknown planet in an unknown distant reaches of the universe shooting an unknown rocket ship that's aimed directly at Earth traveling light years, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, until it enters the Earth's atmosphere, opening up its cargo of DNA. And so they call that directed panspermia. Uh, I'm sorry. (laughs) Hold on. So we can't figure out evolution on Earth, so we just push the problem somewhere else? That's exactly it. That's exactly it. All right, continue. I didn't need to interrupt. (laughs) Yeah, one of the co-discoverers of the DNA molecule, and he got the, you know, he was co-recipient of the the Nobel Prize, was Francis Crick, and, and he advocated that kind of idea, this directed panspermia. But 33 evolutionists from respected institutions have written this up, uh, that octopus came from uh, Earth on a comet. They uh, wrote this up in the progress in biophysics and molecular biology. So it's not some kind of off the, you know, uh, the road there. That This is uh, 33 evolutionists yeah. who are, uh, you know, they're being theoretical, and I understand that. But it's, it's what I call ABC, anything but creation. Right. And so... I mean, but then at that point, it, it, I, I don't know. It, it just, it's, it's so far flung to me. It's just yeah. like, all right. Yeah. 
Okay. And so the octopus is, is quite amazing. And, and just one quick story, a, a researcher, uh, you know, they would raise these octopus and the octopus would get to, to recognize people because they are intelligent creatures and they see the world much like us. And so one researcher took a shrimp, an octopus loves shrimp. The only mm-hmm. thing they like Me more too. than shrimp are blue crabs. And this lady took a shrimp, which was starting to turn, you know, that seafood turns very quickly. And this is starting to get kind of funky. And so she held the shrimp, and the octopus could only see the shrimp. And so the octopus put her arm out to grab the shrimp. And they have sensors on their uh, their arm, you know, with the suckers. Mm-hmm. And, and it's it's very, very sensitive, each arm. So no sooner did the octopus grab the shrimp that it could sense that this shrimp was no good. And so while the octopus is staring at the lady who gave uh, the octopus a shrimp, the shrimp took the, uh, excuse me, the octopus took the shrimp and jammed it into the drain of her tank. <laughs> staring at her all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you know, that's, could we maybe use the word humor there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, some people are now saying, you know, there there is an indication that octopus have humor. Well, awesome. I, I think they're incredible creatures. Uh, I mean, just go online and look at videos of them. They're, oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're fantastic. And the speed at which they change color is also pretty incredible. Those chromatophores work at, at breakneck speed, a fraction of a second. And that's what makes it so ina- amazing yeah. is that they can change so quickly and literally just m- melt right into the uh, environment that they uh, find themselves. Wow. It's The scientific word is spooky. <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> All right. Um, another sea creature here uh, we'll, we'll dive into, no pun intended, um, the jellyfish. And so there's a lot of different types of jellyfish. Uh, you know, sometimes they, they wash up on the shore. You step on them. They sting you. Mm-hmm. They, they don't bite you. As a kid, I thought they, they bit you. That's, that's not what they do. Uh, but they sting you. Uh, so what's going on with the jellyfish? These creatures that, like, if you look at them, they don't look like they're really made of anything, except for maybe jelly. Yeah, so jellyfish are unique. They're called in zoology, we call them the Skyphozoa. And you're right, they're only about 94% water, which oh, wow. means that that remaining 6% is insanely complex yeah. and all. And so God designed the jellyfish with no bones, no heart, no brains, but with eyes. Some jellyfish have not one, but two or even three sets of different eyes. Okay. And of course, it's hard to say, well, this is what a jellyfish sees, because you can't interview a jellyfish and say, what do you see now? You know, not that yet. type of thing. So, <laughs> so they, but to, to, just to have three different sets of eyes are, are, are quite amazing. But uh, some jellyfish are longer than a blue whale. Wow. So blue whale's the largest sea creature, uh, largest creature in the world for that yeah. matter. And some jellyfish are, are, you know, with their tentacles and all, are as long as a blue whale. Others are about as small as a grain of sand. Wow. Which is pretty amazing uh, size-wise. One species is designed with a, what they call a green fluorescent protein, a, uh, a GFP. Now, this green fluorescent protein is widely used as a marker in cell biology, and it comes from the jellyfish. And specifically, they use the GFP in uh, Alzheimer's disease research and breast cancer disease, uh, breast cancer research. Okay. So this uh, uh, green fluorescent protein is, is quite important, and it comes from the lowly jellyfish. So uh, you said stinging jellyfish. Yeah, they can't bite or anything, but they have special cells called nematocytes. And these nematocytes uh, inject poison or venom into the victim, whether it's you or a fish or whatever else. But when you look at a nematocyst, and again, you can go online and, and look at these things, they have it's just one cell that has a hair trigger. And once that hair trigger is initiated, it sends a spiral, uh, a very uh, wicked-looking barb uh, through the cell right up into whatever it, it uh, brushed up against okay. it. And, of course, inside of this barb is some poison. And so, one, you probably wouldn't even feel it, but multiply that several dozen times, hundreds of times, and you got something that, that hurts quite a bit. 
Can they kill you? Well, at the box jellyfish of the South Pacific, specifically the area around the Indian Ocean, can kill you. Okay. And it, it attacks the, uh, the system in regard to our heart, the cardiac conduction system. And so, yeah, the, uh, the box jellyfish, and they're very tiny, very okay. small, uh, but they pack quite a punch. And it's the jo box jellyfish, which is kind of square in shape. And that's unique because squares in nature are very, very yeah, rare. Not uh, there's, seen. for example, uh, square bacteria that look like uh, uh, microscopic saltine crackers. But um, the box jellyfish is kind of square, and uh, it has this very devastating uh, venom, and it has uh, two sets of eyes. And it can get around. You, know, you can sense the difference between light and dark and all that and, and make changes. Hmm. Okay, so... Probably not a box jellyfish, but are jellyfish edible? I mean, they have jelly in the name, right? <laughs> yeah. Good question. Are jellyfish edible? And the fact is that these sea turtles love jellyfish, okay. and they don't seem to be uh, uh, affected you know, by eating jellyfish. And obviously, we still have these big old sea turtles, and so they, they're doing just fine. But they eat jellyfish, and you think, well, 94% water, you'd have to eat quite a few <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to get yeah. any kind of sustenance. Good point. Yeah, but uh, they do, and, and they keep the, uh, the jellyfish population down. So, okay. And yes, people on occasion eat jellyfish as well you know and i'll pass yeah same <laughs> but uh yeah so, some people uh, uh eat jellyfish and it's it's not a real popular dish but. right but hey uh mm -hmm. i guess if it's there yeah <laughs> well as someone who's a very adventurous eater and loves seafood i'll pass on the jellyfish yeah. so all right uh let's take a step back uh take a deep breath how are you doing right now good oh, good good all right well, it's time for our random science question of the day, okay? Uh, this one's kind of a unique one, uh, but we'll see what you have to say about it. Let's say you could build your own invertebrate, okay? Uh, and let's just assume that all the pieces work together. Um, what features would you include? Well, you know, as a zoologist, I would have to kind of go down the laundry list of features that we find in invertebrates to begin with. That's all we have to go by. Right. And so that would obviously be something that would be irritable. In other words, it could sense its environment, irritation. Uh, it also would have to be able to break down uh, food or, or utilize some kind of energy source. And, you know, like a, a car uses gasoline or electricity right. and all that. And so that's what this would have to do. Um, it would be nice it could be able to reproduce itself, although that's not, you know, absolutely required. Just if you want to... Uh, to build your own. Yeah, yeah. to build your own. Uh, and and the, the, there's a, a number of facets and factors that would be included to have your own creature that could sustain itself in the environment. And so, um, yeah, it all depends whether you're going to build something that lives in the water or on land. And so, okay, pick one. Oh, there okay. Well, I'm probably on land. On land, yeah, all right. be because uh, water. You know, you have to choose between salt water and fresh water, and of course, then you would run into corrosion problems and right. all. And so, yeah. how many how many legs would your uh, your invertebrate have? I would say six to eight. Six to eight. Yeah. Okay. Because you know, four yeah, that'd be all right, but uh, you know, you have two extra uh, legs that could give you a little bit more stability. Okay. So we're talking yeah. some form of arachnid. Yeah. So Dr. Sherwin's build your own invertebrate <laughs> would be an arachnid. Got it. Okay. Uh, venom? Yes. No. Oh, well, a venom probably um, just you know the the. Uh, yeah, that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, <laughs> use a form of uh, something called carboxylic acid, which yeah. is what you find in, in for example, um, ants or whatever. Okay, and they and that's what gives ants their powerful sting. Oof. Okay. No. Uh, maybe not deadly, but able no. to defend themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And raise a welt. All right. Well, um, my invertebrate would be completely uh, useless, <laughs> uh, but it would look really cool because I don't know. Uh, what it needs to survive. So <laughs> we'll go with yours. All right. All right. Uh, well, thank you for uh, engaging in that thought experiment with sure. me. Okay. Uh, we'll dive right back into it. Trilobite. Um, trilobites are, we have a bunch of fossil trilobites. When I think about trilobites, I think, you know, fossil trilobites. Um, what 
uh, is this creature? Because uh, it's not one that you like. When you talk about a jellyfish, everyone kind of knows what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about a trilobite. What is it? What makes it unique? Etc. Well, trilobites are very fascinating creatures, and they're found at the lowest level of what we call the geologic column. They're found in the Cambrian and the Ore Division systems, uh, basically. And because they're ocean bottom dwelling creatures, that's what God designed them for. We would find trilobites in the lowest levels of the so-called geologic column. Now, we believe the geologic column was formed over the Genesis flood, that year-long flood that occurred about 4,500 years ago. And if you had a flood of sediments that covered the earth, then logically it would be that trilobites would be buried first because, as I say, they're ocean-bottom dwelling creatures. Right. Now, evolutionists corrupt this by saying, no, 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 trilobites when life was first getting started on this planet over a half billion, with a B, half billion years ago. However, when you look at a trilobite, you're looking at something very, very sophisticated. Okay. As a one paleontology teacher told his class, and my friend Gary Parker talks about this, this teacher who was an evolutionist, this was years ago, he said to his class, don't let anybody tell you that trilobites are simple creatures. And he was an evolutionist who said that. Now we understand in the 21st century, trilobites are horribly complex. Because, Even more so than back then. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Because, uh, first of all, trilobites are arthropods. They have paired jointed appendages, and they have this chitinous exoskeleton, like, for example, a Texas roach has. And when you step on the roach, it pops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so trilobites, uh, they come in all sizes. They get size of your thumb to the size of your hand and maybe even a little little bit bigger. Okay. And so one authority on trilobites is a guy by the name of Niles Eldridge out of New York, the American Museum of Natural History. Niles Eldridge is no creationist. He's not written one. He's written two books uh, denigrating and attacking creation science. Well, as I say, Niles Eldridge is a world authority on trilobites. And so if he really wanted to make a case for evolution, and since he's an authority on trilobites, he would simply tell the reader, here's how trilobites evolve from a non-trilobite ancestor. But he didn't say that in either one of his books, which I find kind of strange there. But as I say, trilobites have always been trilobites. Uh, they're found in the lowest level of the geologic column. They are arthropods. And how do we know so much about trilobites? How do we know the details? Like, for example, their eye anatomy. Well, wait a minute. If trilobites had been extinct all these years, we would say thousands of years. Evolution is, say, a half a billion years. Right. A half a billion years will go with the evolutionary timetable. And we find extremely well-preserved trilobites, especially their eye anatomy. This indicates that they must have been buried suddenly and catastrophically, like you would get with a... Um, well, a flood could do something like that. Uh, a really big flood. Hmm. And so the fact is... Interesting. That, yeah. <laughs> and so we, we have these trilobites with this well-preserved eye anatomy because they were suddenly uh, buried and very, very quickly. And so um, they have a double lens system. And that's how they can see in, in the water that cor it corrects for this underwater vision. Okay. And so um, it, they are really fascinating creatures. All sizes, all shapes, but 100% trilobites nonetheless. And they are currently extinct. That's it, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, they're extinct, and it's too bad because I would really like to see live trilobites. Yeah. But um, they, they really were uh, fascinating creatures in what we call the pre-flood world. Okay, awesome. We're on number, oh, I don't know how to count. This is number six, uh, echinoderm? Yes. Uh, okay. So what is an echinoderm? Well, echinoderm simply means spiny skin. It's okay. really taking Greek and Latin words together and putting a word together called echinoderm. And uh, it, it's, it means spiny skin. So when you pick up a sea star, of course, the first thing you notice, it's kind of rocky uh, surface there. And uh, they used to be called starfish. But you know, when I was teaching uh, biology, I always told my students, it's not a starfish, it's a sea star. Okay, And so... Uh, in 2020, an evolutionist by the name of Michael Allaby stated, and I quote, the presence of a water-based vascular system, a complex internal apparatus of fluid-containing tubes. Now, the reason why I mention that is because uh, uh, echinoderms, these sea stars, are so amazingly complex. 
And so when you watch a sea star as it moves across the bottom of the uh, the ocean or in a tank or whatever else, or if they go up the side of the tank and you can see these tube feet mm-hmm. uh, uh, adhering to the the wall, the glass wall of the tank there, you get an appreciation for how complex that is. Now, sea stars love to eat clams. Well, how do you get it? How do you eat a clam? I mean, the clam... Uh, it's got the shell, right? shell yeah, yeah, and closes uh, shut. And so the sea star will come up and it will drape itself over the two uh, shells and then using those uh, uh, tube feet will begin to exert pressure to open up the valves. Now, it takes a long time, and the uh, the clam is using one muscle that it's contracting to keep those two halves of the shell closed. Mm. But the the uh, echinoderm, the uh, the sea star, is always successful, and pretty soon the muscle of the uh, the clam begins to relax just a little bit, and this is where it gets kind of gross. But the sea star actually everts its stomach down through that crack in between the two shells, and the stomach goes down in there and begins to secrete uh, uh, enzymes, digestive enzymes. So it doesn't swallow necessarily like when we when we consider eating it puts its stomach out out oh. and that's what's kind of gross and <laughs> it, puts it puts it down into the body uh the soft body uh that's obviously between the two shells and secretes those digestive enzymes and, and so that's how it's killed well neat and yeah. disgusting <laughs> <laughs> now uh, sea stars are also able to undergo this process called regeneration as well mm-hmm. and regenerate there's nothing simple about that those right. Are very very complex. Uh, so if it loses a limb, it would be able to to regrow. Yeah, right. Okay. And this is what fishermen didn't understand back about a century and a half, two centuries ago, because the the sea stars there at the bottom of the ocean would be eating all of the clams, and the fishermen would be out there trying to harvest the clams, and you get a bunch of sea stars there and and eat up all the clams, and the fishermen would get upset. And what would they do when they would get uh, sea stars in their net? They would take their knife and they would chop them up and throw the parts overboard, not realizing they're just exacerbate, exacerbating it. And yeah. that this, uh, you're just producing a, a population bloom of more sea stars. So uh, the, the sea star, it would grow another limb, but if you chop off a limb, would it grow another sea star? It, it, statistically, it's, it's able to do that. Wow. Yeah. And so it doesn't, it looks kind of weird. Yeah. You know, it doesn't look picture perfect or anything, but um, this is, you know, they're, they're just really unique, unique animals. Yeah, that's wild. In 2022, evolutionist Daniel Hall of the Smithsonian said, and I quote, echinoderms possess a unique internal skeleton composed of thousands to millions of calcium carbonate um, uh, components known as ossicles. Uh, similar to complicated three-dimensional puzzle. Wow. And so, again, I, I emphasize that because evolutionists sometimes say, well, sea stars, you know, conoderms are simple. They're not simple at all. No. You know, just like the worms we discussed, they are hardly simple. So they can undergo regeneration, which is a coordinated process that's still somewhat a mystery to scientists. And that's a quote from an evolutionist, wow. uh, Hall. So how can anybody point to a sea star and and say, oh, this is just a simple animal. They're, yeah. they're not simple at all. No, not at all. Okay. Last last creature on the docket for today. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the sponge. And when we say the sponge, we're not talking about that. Uh, the, here's a reminder for everyone watching and listening. If you haven't replaced your uh, sponge recently, do so. It's probably gross. No, <laughs> but we're not referring to that. We're talking about a oh, living creature. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about it. Well, saving the best till last because I really like sponges. Okay. They are absolutely amazing, and you know they look like a blob, and and they looks like they don't do anything. But hidden within a sponge is incredible metabolic machinery of all types. And evolutionist uh, Jerry Coyne in my hometown of Chicago said, and I quote, around 600 million years ago, uh, ago, a whole gamut of relatively simple but multi-celled organisms arise, including, he says, worms, jellyfish, and sponges, Sponge. end quote. But the periphera, and that's what sponges are called, or the periphera, are exceedingly complex. 
If you took a cross section through a sponge, you would find at least four very unique, very complex cells that are not found in any other animal. It, Which is weird because, like, they would supposedly evolve into something exactly. or out of something. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. And so these these cell types, I won't go into the detail, but they're very very complex. Now sponges don't have a nervous system. They don't have a muscular system. Uh, uh, sponges don't have like nerve cells that we would associate with uh, the nervous system, uh, and yet there is a response. In, in the whole sponge. A whole sponge can respond to some kind of external stimuli. Okay. Well, how do they do that if they don't have a nervous system, if they don't have these, for example, uh, nerve cells? And in 2020, uh, five evolutionists said that there is excitation in the sponge by, they said, an unknown mechanism. Well, okay, if it's unknown, that's fine. I'm not criticizing the evolutionist. But wait a minute. They keep telling us that sponges are so simple right. and so basic, and yet... This sponge able to respond to external stimuli, and yet they don't have a nervous system or anything, how do they do it? And these five evolutionists said, well, it's an unknown mechanism. Well, okay, great. Let's go ahead and investigate research. Right. I doubt that that would validate in any way evolutionary naturalism. Right. It would rather unearth, uncover the incredible sophistication of the creator. That's That seems to be kind of, kind of the theme here. These creatures that are... If they're uh, being found earlier, before we knew, like before we could like really dig into what they are, what they're made of, how they respond, how they react, mm -hmm. they may look simple on the outside, right? right. The jellyfish, sponge, uh, sea star, almost said starfish, uh, earthworm, <laughs> you know, these creatures that look kind of simple, uh, but the more you dig, the more it just kind of turns, at least the evolutionary timetable of like, these are simple creatures. It kind of turns it on its head. Well, it does. Uh, we like to say in creation science that there's no such thing as a simple creature. Right. Uh, there's no such thing as simple life. Uh, we used to be taught that uh, bacteria were simple. <laughs> bacteria, you know, we uh, any bacteria is a very, very complex. Uh, if it's living, it's complex. That's okay. what we like to say. And in terms of the sponge, uh, the sponge undergo what's called um, cell independence. Okay. And the cell independence, there are two examples. One is the regeneration that you and I just talked mm -hmm. about. And also there's something called somatic embryogenesis. And it gets, into, it gets very, very complex. But uh, the somatic embryogenesis and the regeneration are part of this cell independence. And that's in the lowly sponge. Right. So, um, but there's one other thing that just absolutely is unbelievable, and that is that sponges are designed by the creator to have glass-like projections that are microscopic called spicules. Okay. And these spicules act like... Um, what, what are the uh, um, fiber optics? Oh, okay. So light from, you know, com coming down from the surface of the ocean into where the sponges are, the sunlight will strike these spicules, and these spicules act as uh, fiber optics and directs this sunlight energy into the sponge's photosynthetic tissue. So it's like a kind of an, an antenna. Okay. And photosynthesis, of course, means to take light energy and make life energy, that is sugar. Which plants do, yeah, right? Yeah, plants do. And, and any cell that has a chlorophyll, which okay. is uh, the, the uh, pigment f that helps with the photosystems. Okay. And all that, that gets into photosynthesis. And there's nothing simple about photosynthesis. Right. And yet, I, sadly, for the evolutionists, they have to suggest that photosynthesis is the first form of metabolism or life. But... Uh, the two photosystems, photosystem two and one, that uh, phosphorylates uh, the various molecules, that's unbelievably complex. And some sponges, because they have um, the, the chlorophyll uh, in, in a mutualistic relationship, can undergo this photosynthetic activity. It sounds like we'll need to have a podcast on uh, photosynthesis <laughs> at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. And the one thing that uh, was said just uh, two years ago in Science Magazine, Volume 374, not one, but 13 evolutionists, the main author is a guy by the name of Musser, M-U-S-S-E-R, said in the pages of Science Magazine, I couldn't believe this, they said, uh, these 13 evolutionists said, sponges represent our distant animal relatives, end quote. And I'm going, you know... <laughs> Those four cells that I just mentioned, right. there, you know, they're unique to sponges. 
uh, the only thing that sponges and people have in common is DNA. They both are programmed by the DNA molecule, but that's not evidence of a common ancestor. That's evidence of a common designer. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And, and like, it, it's just kind of wild to think, oh, we came from that, you know, it, it, as different as, as it is, it, it is, it's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, I just, you know, these claims and it's like, you can just look and see uh, the very, just like from the outside, how very different, but you look even deeper and it's like, oh wait, no, that's not just different. This is impossible. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. All right. Well, if you had to pick one of these seven, which would be your favorite? Well, I think probably it would be a toss-up between the the uh, the jellyfish and the sponges. Okay. So yeah, I'll go with the sponges. Go they, with the sponge. Yeah, right. I, I want to do a, um, s- some work on that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you for talking about uh, these uh, incredible invertebrates. Uh, with me. Um, if you had to like wrap it all up into just a couple of sentences uh, for our listeners and viewers, what would you have to say to them? Well, we have these two conflicting worldviews, evolutionism and creation. And we find that whenever we address life, whenever we see a life process, and by the way, life is very difficult to define uh, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ says in John 14 and verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the, and the life. And so what I like to tell my students and my audiences is that however you define life, Jesus Christ must be in the center of that definition because he is the author and the giver and the sustainer of life. Mm. And only he can give life. Life does not come from non-life. And so with the invertebrates, which are supposedly simple, we have seen here the past couple of minutes just how awesome are they are in their complexity. And it points to not time and chance and natural processes, but plan and purpose and special creation mm-hmm. that is by the Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you uh, for chatting about these with me. Um, man, uh, just having such a knowledge about these animals, it, it's just incredible to hear and you know i i like to think oh i know a lot about animals but i don't i i'm I'm humbled every time so uh thank you very much (laughs) and thank you to all of our listeners and viewers for tuning in and uh we encourage you uh, we've covered seven uh invertebrates here uh we can't cover each one of them so much in depth you know uh we just don't have the time but we encourage you to look into them visit icr.org we do have articles about many of these creatures Uh, just learn how complex they are Uh, and as far as this video goes uh, make sure to like subscribe share make sure to hit that bell so you are uh, notified of future episodes of the creation podcast or creation.live or any other uh, video that we might post Uh, but we hope that you've uh, just learned a lot and we'll see you next time on the creation podcast We want to say a huge thank you to our members and patrons. If you'd like to see your name here and unlock perks like early access to our podcasts, members only polls and live streams, behind the scenes footage or exclusive video content, links are in the description below.